do have hurricane warnings up for the entire coast. You can see how quickly the water is already starting to rise. This is the heavier band that is causing some flooding. This is what it takes to provide medical assistance during a flash flood. We could have some trees down and power outages from Sampson County and Goldsboro up through Rocky Mountain. I admit it, I was scared. Really a pretty amazing uh, and unbelievable experience and sensation. It's been all day pounding our coastline and frankly pounding central North Carolina as well. This is the back end of the hurricane. The strangest report I saw, and this tells you how big this storm is, Canada issued a tropical storm warning. And hello from the NBC 17 studios. I'm Chief Meteorologist Wes Hohenstein. Over the course of the next 30 minutes, the Precision Weather Team will look back at the damage from the 2011 hurricane season and what we can learn from it going into the 2012 season. Now, hurricane season officially started June 1st, but the season actually began much earlier. Already we've had two named storms. Of course, that includes Tropical Storm Barrel, which hit North Florida early on Memorial Day morning, snapping trees and knocking out power like most storms, but also causing some flooding, mainly because of its slow movement and heavy rain. A few days later, Barrel made its way to North Carolina, though only as a tropical depression, bringing heavy rain and not much else to the NBC 17 viewing area. It did serve as a good reminder, though, that hurricanes have the ability to impact every county in our state. Of course, the damage from that storm, minimal compared to the one hurricane that hit North Carolina last year, Hurricane Irene. The storm crashed into the coast of North Carolina on August 27th, causing hundreds of millions of dollars in damage. By the time the storm had finished its trek up the East Coast, it was blamed for 49 deaths six of those in our state. It also caused an estimated $15.8 billion in damage to the United States. And meteorologist Jeremy Baker was on the coast when Irene hit and recently went back to see how recovery efforts are going months later. Currituck Sound on a calm spring day. Boaters out boating, people enjoying the view, fishermen with their lines in the water, and the water where it's supposed to be, unlike last August. You can see how quickly the water is already starting to rise. Water rushed over this roadway near a community called Collington, flooding Judy Beasley's store with 41 inches of water. We spent 10 days cleaning the mud and dumping all the merchandise. In its place, new merchandise and paint and doors that are once again open. We're up and running. Everything's been redone and we're ready for business. And so far, the year has started out really well just like most of the rest of Dare County. The community has recovered very well. We're a very resilient community. Resilient, yes, but a little stubborn? Possibly. Not everyone left when they were warned to. I stayed and it was fine, it was just windy. We didn't even get any flooding and I live in this area. Maybe she didn't get any flooding around her home, but in other areas, the water came far inland. I'm gonna step to the bypass, it was pretty, it was pretty bad. I'm about two blocks away from the sound, which is directly behind me, and during Irene, the water came in so fast and it was so deep that, believe it or not, you didn't see cars in these streets, but instead, schools of fish. We were watching fish swim. Yeah, all sorts of stuff in the water, yeah. Water that at some point will rise again and turn these roads into rivers and lakes, and they know that the when, where, and how much really isn't up to them. We're sure that we're going to get water at some time, but it's up to God how deep it gets. Hmm. Now you were there, you saw the damage. Were you surprised at how quickly everything got cleaned up? It really was. I mean, there was really no evidence that a hurricane came through about nine months ago. Everything's been rebuilt, just a couple of trees still down, but everything else is fine. No water where it's not supposed to be. And that one seafood store, mm -hmm. all back to normal. And fortunately, FEMA couldn't help them out with that. That came out of their own pockets, but they're doing well. Now, those residents are used to that. Did anyone throw their hands up and is moving up to the mountains? Not at all. Like you said, they're used to it. So, you know, that happened. They've rebuilt. If it happens again, they'll do exactly the same thing. Hmm. All right. Thank you, Jeremy sure. Baker. All right. Now, let's take a look at the upcoming hurricane season and the long-range forecast. There are several we pay attention to every year. First, Colorado State. Dr. Gray and Dr. Klausbach have been forecasting hurricanes for nearly 30 years, and this year they're leaning toward a less active season. 
with 10 named storms, four of those becoming hurricanes, and two of them becoming major hurricanes. And our government just released their outlook in late May, and in their range, they are forecasting nine to 15 named storms, four to eight major hurricanes, and one to three major hurricanes, four to eight hurricanes. And there's one more hurricane outlook we've paid attention to in the past few years, and it's just down the street, NC State. Our own Bill Ray paid them a visit recently to get their take on the upcoming season. Yeah, they can uh, put on that wall. Okay. Since 2004, Dr. Shea at NC State has been developing seasonal hurricane outlooks, and each year he gets a little more confident. So every year we got more information coming in and more data, and that work then goes into your uh, new model and that will help you improve it. Dr. Shea works with the statistical department to produce the forecast and this is the second year for grad student Morgan Lennon to actually issue the forecast. It's not that you want to be excited that a hurricane happens but you want your forecast to be um, accurate each year. Different variables go into the forecast including the probability of El Nino or La Nina occurring. I look at those for each season um, and use that number along with how they related to the number of storms in previous years to forecast this year. Ocean water in the eastern tropical Pacific has warmed some, so that means a mild El Nino has developed and the forecast reflects that. So that increased the wind shear, so that limits the development of tropical storms in the Atlantic. So that's the main reason that they're keeping the number down. The prediction is for 30% less storms in the entire Atlantic compared to last year, and a decrease to about a 50% chance from last year's 70% chance of a landfall storm along the southeast coast. No matter what the long range seasonal forecast is for, whether it be above normal, below normal, or average, you still need to be prepared at home, including having plenty of batteries and flashlights and water just in case. So even though we forecast a lower number of storms this year, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be a storm heading to North Carolina and we should definitely all still pay attention during hurricane season and um, make sure we're aware of when the storms are coming. So what is the ultimate purpose of long range forecasts? The main purpose was to raise the awareness of hurricane activity, hurricane season is coming and the information is you know, probably not specific enough for people to make any decision. As for what's next, Dr. Shea is trying to extend the seasonal outlooks further into the future to look for trends years down the road. We're also trying to figure out whether there are any trends, you know, decreasing trend, increasing trend in frequency or in intensity. You know, some of that may be tied to uh, some long-term climate change. Bill Ray, NBC 17 News. So once again, the forecast numbers from NC State. There's the normal year, 12, 6, and 3. They're forecasting 7 to 10 name storms, 4 to 7 hurricanes, 1 to 3 major hurricanes. Now, just how accurate are NC State's predictions? Well, last year, researchers there predicted up to 16 name storms, with 7 to 9 becoming hurricanes. And they weren't too far off. Final totals last year, 19 name storms, with seven hurricanes. And as the case is every year, the week leading up to the start of the hurricane season is Hurricane Preparedness Week across the state of North Carolina. And the biggest part of being prepared is making sure your home is ready for disaster. That means a hurricane kit that should include copies of insurance papers and identification in a waterproof container, a first aid kit, weather radio, flashlight and batteries, and a change of clothes and bedding. Personal hygiene items, can't forget that. And one that's easy to forget, cash. You never know how long credit card machines might be down because of power or phone lines being down. Now, while evacuations are rare for our part of the state, we learned with Hurricane Floyd in 1999, inland flooding can drive you from your home in only a few moments notice. So if you do have to evacuate, here's what to take. Any paper documents that prove who you are, where your money is and your insurance policies, anything you could need immediately to recover. Also keep in mind those things that can't be replaced, namely a lot of pictures. Folks, we can't go replace those images of your children they were, when they were growing up. You should also shoot video or take pictures of your home before any storm to help prove what was damaged. And remember to back up hard drive on disks or a flash drive that you can take with you. Now, one part of the state that is no stranger to evacuation orders, the Outer Banks. Still to come as we prepare for the 2012 hurricane season, a look back at Hurricane Irene's impact on Cape Hatteras and how they're rebuilding. Plus, 
mm -hmm. I'll admit it, I was scared. From terrifying moments to rebuilding, how a local mall is putting back the pieces nine months after losing its roof to Irene. And as we head to break, here's a reminder of this year's names for tropical storms and hurricanes. Don't forget, Alberto and Beryl already crossed off the list. Now this is exclusive video we captured last August showing the roof collapsing at the Berkeley Mall in Goldsboro. This was after the initial collapse that was caused by wind breaking a wall. Now our Justin Quisenberry went back to the mall to see how rebuilding is going and what lessons have been learned. Walk in Lindell Williams shoes and you'll find yourself at the Berkeley Mall nearly every day. By coming out here exercising every day I've seen it revived. He was supposed to be here for an August 27th event. The day Hurricane Irene collapsed the roof. I was just glad that I wasn't here and nobody was here. The mall manager closed the mall that day in anticipation of Irene. She probably saved some lives. Security Supervisor Paul Anger says he was the only person at the mall that day. Yeah, this is about where I was when it came down. He was just uh, yeah. 20 feet away as it collapsed. Some of the ceiling tiles were still in the grids and it just came down all right in front of me. Well, I can't really repeat what was going through my mind at the time. The mall closed for exactly one week. People were surprised that they opened up the mall back up. Basically from here to Belk's store was all open air. There, there was no roof at all. You can still see some divots in the floor in front of Belk where a retaining wall stood for about four months. It closed off the mall entrance to Belk, but the store remained open. Three others had to relocate. Construction is still underway. In all, five stores, two of which were empty, were damaged. The back rooms of those stores were completely destroyed. Crews have gutted the spaces, and while they're at it, they're upgrading. Well, it's been amazing to see it coming back and uh, to what it once was. Meanwhile, Williams has walked away with a greater understanding of nature's force. Expect anything from a hurricane. <laughs> Think that made us all know that they're unpredictable. Mother Nature, what can you say? Just pray that it don't happen again. <laughs> Hmm. And that was our Justin Quisenberry reporting from Goldsboro. Now, physical damage wasn't the only scar Irene left on Goldsboro. A 15-year-old girl was killed in a crash there during the storm. One of six deaths in our state blamed on Hurricane Irene. Now, coming up, as hurricane season peaks, so too does the political season. And this year, both parties are having conventions in areas prone to hurricanes. So what happens if a tropical storm decides to crash the party? First, though, we go back to Cape Hatteras for a look at how that community recovers from storm after storm and the permanent plans to fix a problem that seems to come about every summer. And welcome back. You know Hatteras Island is used to taking the brunt of East Coast hurricanes, and last summer was no exception. NBC 17 meteorologist Jeremy Baker shows us how that area is recovering. When Hurricane Irene crashed ashore that Saturday morning in August, the winds and power of the water left a hole in Highway 12 where a heavily used bridge used to be. Less than two months later, construction on the temporary bridge was finished, and now it seems to be doing its job. Uh, right now, to me, it's fantastic. It's, it's getting the, the lifeblood back to Hatteras Island, making our, our, our guests be able to come down. You know, how it holds up if we had another storm, I think it's the big question a lot of people have. But officials say there's no need to worry. It's stable. Um, we expect it, it's survived the winter and the northeasters we've had, so we've been very pleased with that. Construction on the permanent bridge is expected to begin later this year. The Highway 12 bridge was just one of the many things Irene damaged last year. Rental homes along the Outer Banks got smacked as well. We had probably 55 homes that had direct water damage from the sound that actually got into the homes. Nine months later, the site and sounds of construction are being replaced with those of ordinary life, especially here on Merlot Beach, which looked like this just days after Irene. Most of the houses in Rodanthe are fixed and ready to go for the summer season, with the exception of that eyesore right behind me. But officials want everyone to know that Hatteras Island is completely open for business. 
uh, everything is spiffed up. We've been through our spring cleanings now. The, everything's ready to go, and uh, it's a wonderful place to come visit, and they should, and we're glad to have them. Happy to have all visitors, except for the one that last year went by the name Irene. In the Outer Banks, Jeremy Baker, NBC 17 News. All right, Jeremy, thank you. You know, at East Carolina University's annual hurricane workshop, National Hurricane Center Director Bill Reed said he had a bad feeling as Hurricane Irene approached the East Coast. But while last season was a big topic, the first thing I ask him, the question I've been getting the most, does the early formation of Alberto and Beryl mean the rest of the season will be busy too? You look back at the years where we've had early onset in May, uh, there's not really a correlation in the number of storms that you've had in the season. It doesn't really portray what the bulk of the hurricane season will be August, September, October time frame. So maybe we won't have to worry about a record setting hurricane season this year, but there will be some worries in North Carolina and Florida when the Democratic and Republican National Conventions come to Charlotte and Tampa. Tampa Convention Center is in a CAT 2 evacuation zone, so, uh, and they're having it the last week of August. It's going to be a monumental task if the threat occurs because they're in an evacuation setting, whereas the folks in Charlotte, it's protecting people in place if you have an inland effect like a Hugo. Hugo, of course, hit the Carolinas more than 20 years ago, but last year, the big storm for us and the entire East Coast was Irene, and from Miami, they knew it was going to be a big deal. This track is going to cover 50, 50 million people. It's going to be a long, long three-day slog as this thing goes north. That three-day slide led to more than $15 billion in damage up and down the East Coast. Damage that in some parts of the state is still being rebuilt. And it's not just people's homes, something the director thinks might require some more thought. It's not just the cost of the house. It's like you pointed out, infrastructure, roads, bridges, uh, fire, police, anything that goes to making a community safe, that becomes a taxpayer-based thing, not just the homeowner who says, I can pay for my own house to have it built. And in our economic times, that's becoming a, a discussion we need to have. And you know, a week after that conference in May in Greenville, Bill Reed, retired. So we wish him all the best in his retirement and welcome Dr. Rick Nabb to the helm at the National Hurricane Center, who some of you may know as the hurricane expert at the Weather Channel the past few years, but he also spent many years before that at the National Hurricane Center. All right, now you heard us ask the director about the political conventions coming this summer, both to hurricane prone areas. The Democrats will rally in Charlotte the first weekend in September. And while Charlotte is hours from the coast, an analysis shows since 1850, almost a dozen storms have gone through Charlotte in the first week of September. That's one every 14 years. The last time it happened, 1999, 13 years ago. Charlotte though says they have an emergency plan in place that includes the Secret Service. All it takes is for a really fast moving storm that carries those high winds that could really damage and shut Charlotte down again very easy. Now the Democratic National Convention Committee says the president's acceptance speech at Bank of America Stadium will be rain or shine. So what about the GOP? Their convention is expected to bring 50,000 people to Tampa, Florida at the end of August, just two weeks before the traditional peak of hurricane season. On top of that, every location for the convention is right in the middle of an evacuation zone. That means any evacuation would need a fleet of vehicles. Would we have to find additional vehicles to move some of the folks that don't have access to cars or taxis? Uh, probably so. We're ready to respond to whatever is happening. Among those vehicles that would likely be uh, evacuated, 300 charter buses already on hand to shuttle the delegates around town. The Democratic National Convention in Charlotte will be the first time the state gets to use one of its newest resources. Next, we get an inside look at the brand new state emergency operations center and we'll show you how it will respond to disasters in the future faster and more efficiently. You know that feeling you get after you buy a new car, can't wait to drive it, or you get a new phone, you can't wait to check out all the features? Well, that may be exactly how Doug Hoyle, the North Carolina Director of Emergency Management, feels with a brand new operation building in Raleigh. He recently gave me a tour of the new facility and talked to us about how it could help this hurricane season. We're excited about having new stuff, and, uh, and certainly we believe that it will benefit the citizens of the state of North Carolina when we do have to activate and use it. Uh, 
put and that but is a pretty big exception you see in order to fully use the new facility there would have to be some kind of disaster requiring activation of the state's emergency management department something the director definitely doesn't want but something that's going to be a lot easier now that they've moved out of the basement of the 50 year old administration building downtown the biggest improvement is the space alone i mean just to give us room to house all the people that come together when we have a big disaster it's not uncommon to have two or three hundred people doing work in the state emergency operations center and it's not just the state's emergency operations that live in the new building opened in february the state highway patrol and the department of transportation operations center have a major presence as well as the national guard inside there's a major briefing room both for government officials and media the governor has an office, and there's even a locked communication room we weren't allowed in with secure lines to Washington, D.C. Sounds like a lot, but it was only last year that many of those functions were in use all at once. We were still recovering from the tornadoes that occurred in April. So our operation was spinning down from the tornado you know, response, but that's what a lot of our commitment was, was still dealing with April tornado issues. And along comes a hurricane and, uh, and we spin right back up. In fact, FEMA had just left. They turned around and came back. And now the 2012 hurricane season is here. So what does the director of emergency management want to remind the entire state about this hurricane season? Most every county in this state has been affected by a hurricane at one time or another, either with severe winds or flooding problems from those storms that, uh, that track further inland. Now, the EOC already knows when they will activate for the first time and get to fully use their new facility. That's this September when the Democratic National Convention is in Charlotte. They plan to be fully activated. Of course, we always hope that facilities like that are only used as a precaution, but history has shown us that's not likely to be the case. So when severe weather or hurricanes do hit, NBC, NBC 17 is with you all the way. You can access all our online resources at NBC17.com. Just type in the keyword hurricane to the search bar. Search bar and don't forget the best weather app in town on your Android or iPhone device. Just search NBC 17 WX. Well, on behalf of everyone here at NBC 17, thanks for joining us.